Well, hi everyone. I'm Rini, a reference librarian at the Concord Library, and I just wanted to introduce Barbara, who is the head of reference, and Kate Hanley, the Concord Director of Sustainability, and then our two presenters. We have Alexandra Wallstrom, the Senior Environmental and Regulatory Coordinator for the Department of Public Works, and Melissa Simoncini, the Environmental Services Program Administrator for the Concord Department of Public Works. And combined, the, both, both Alex and Melissa have decades of experience managing water resources, and they're here tonight to talk about water conservation. So, thank you. Thank you, Rennie, for that introduction. And I just wanna kind of let everyone know that this presentation is going to be recorded tonight. Um, so, Barbara has us, um, recorded so those of us who weren't able to join tonight will be able to kind of view this presentation in the future. Um, so as Rini mentioned, my name is Alexandra Wallstrom. I am the Senior Environmental and Regulatory Coordinator for Concord Public Works Water and Sewer Division. And thank you tonight for joining us for the Water Conservation in Concord program. And so this program was coordinated with a little bit of effort amongst the Free Concord Free Public Library, um, Kate with the Sustainability Division, and then a few of us here in Public Works. And we want to just thank you all for those who participated in the Facebook poll. You kind of helped shape the presentation tonight. So we had a poll with some uh, different topics relating to water conservation and got some feedback on what folks were most interested in learning more about, which topics you were most interested in, and tried to tailor the program to touch on those things a little bit. Um, so next slide, please, Melissa. Perfect. So just a quick introduction. Again, I'm Alex Wallstrom. Um, Melissa is going to be joining us as well. She was the Senior Environmental Regulatory Coordinator for close to a decade, kind of before I inhabited the role. So between the two of us, like Rini said, we've got a couple of decades of water conservation under our belt. Um, and we worked closely with Kate to um, kind of help forward some of the town's sustainability initiatives as they relate to water conservation and some other programs with Concord Public Works. Um, so we've worked together on a number of projects and this is just kind of the latest one of the group. Next slide, perfect. So we're gonna kind of touch on a couple of different things tonight. We'll sort of start with a brief overview of Concord's water supplies, and then we'll go through some of the hot topics that people were interested in learning more about as they relate to conservation. And then kind of at the end of the program, we'll have some time for Q&A. If there's questions that you have that weren't answered during the program, we can address those. Or if questions come up as we're talking about certain things in the program, we can look at those as well. So if you have questions that come up, feel free to use the chat function, and we'll be able to kind of pull those questions together at the end of the presentation. Or um, if you don't have access to the chat function, we can certainly allow people to kind of unmute themselves and ask questions at the end of the program. So we'll kind of start with this map of Concord's water supplies. So for those of you who aren't familiar, we have a variety of different supplies in town to kind of have a little bit more resiliency and robustness in our portfolio. So about 95% or so of the water that we supply to Concord's customers is from groundwater supplies. So we've got six groundwater supplies and we have one surface water supply, which is Nagak Pond, that's technically located in the towns of Acton and Littleton. And that supply is primarily used uh, kind of in recent memory for adding some of the supply that we can't meet with groundwater sources during the summer months where we have increased water demand. And then you'll see that we also have two reservoirs. So we've got the Unner Snack Hill Reservoir and the Pine Hill Reservoir. And those reservoirs serve a couple of functions for us. Not only do they store water when we are not using it, so we're still pumping water from our supplies overnight when folks aren't you know, necessarily using too much water, showering, those types of things. So we'll send up water for storage into those reservoirs. And then the reservoirs also will help us because they will provide water pressure that we have in town. So between the two reservoirs, considering average water demand, we have about three, three days of water supply, give or take. Um, so they help us in a number of different ways, but that's a little bit of a picture of we're primarily a groundwater system, but we have a variety of different sources so that if one supply were to be unavailable for whatever reason, we have other supplies that we can kind of draw from. Um, so now we'll talk a little bit about water use in town. So 2020, as we all kind of know, was not the year we all expected, um, but water use patterns stayed 
pretty much the same with a little with a little bit of a caveat there. So you can kind of see here with this pie chart that the bulk of water use in town is really by residential customers. So we have some commercial institution, institutional customers. Um, you know, we have the correctional facilities in town which use a decent chunk of water, but really that 65% of water use is by residential customers. So that's really the area that we want to focus on our conservation outreach because that's the area where we can kind of see the biggest return on investment in outreach. So we can kind of take a look at, oh, that's okay, next slide. <laughs> so one of the questions that people uh, responded that they were looking for some more information on was water use patterns. So this is a chart that we kind of come to each year to kind of see how did our water use in the prior year compare to our five-year average and our rolling 10-year average. So the blue bars are going to show what we had for water usage in 2020. And then that green line is going to show our rolling 10 year average of water usage in those months. And then that purple line is going to show our five year average. So one of the things that you can kind of see just taking a quick look at the graph is you can see in the winter months. So October is kind of still one of those swing months where we could still have warmer weather. But November through March is kind of the period of time that we consider the winter season. And then May through September is the period of time that we kind of consider the summer season in water world. So you can see those winter months, we're hovering at about 1.5 million gallons per day. That's what MGD stands for is million gallons per day. So on an average day, customers are using one and a half million gallons in the off season. And then you can kind of take a look over there at May, we start to see increases. Last year, we had kind of a substantial increase in usage in the month of June. And then we, we hold pretty steady around two and a half million gallons per day for July through September. So there's a, there's a decent kind of swing between winter usage and summer usage. And so you can kind of see that that trend holds true on a rolling average. And then kind of last year in particular, where we had some kind of increases for the water usage. Next slide. And so this is kind of another chart that's gonna represent the varying water use patterns. So you can, this is a little bit of an older chart. Um, so the, the green bar on the left is the average daily demand. So that's looking at the entirety of the year. If we um, kind of compiled all of the water usage for the 365 days and averaged it out over the year, we've got about 2 million gallons per day or so of water usage. And then again, you can see that blue bar is looking at the winter months. So we're about one and a half million gallons per day, give or take. And then that yellow bar is going to be their, our average summer demand. So two and a half million gallons per day, give or take. Um, and then you can see that bar all the way over on the far right is what we call the peak day demand. So that's really the single day in the year where we have the greatest demand for water. And that's going to be in a summer month in most cases. Um, and so you can see that there's a, a pretty significant increase from that average winter demand to that average peak day demand. There's a, there are a little bit of looking at different things where average winter demand is an average over the entire period and the peak day demand is really the single day point. Um, but it's kind of just another way of understanding how does water use differ throughout the periods of the year. Next slide. So now we're going to kind of break down a little bit more about water use patterns. So we know that about 65% of our water use goes to residential customers. So if we want to look at that a little bit more, how can we break that down? So if we look at indoor water use, about 24% of indoor water use is, is used by toilets with another 20% associated with showering and then about 20% roughly with faucets. So like the kitchen faucet, bathroom faucet, those types of things. And then we've got clothes washers coming in next in line with about 17%. Leaks um, account for about 12% of indoor water use and then 8% is other. So that could be things like ice makers or um, you know if you have a water filter, those types of things. So that's kind of a general way to break down where does water use go indoors? So now we wanna kind of take a look at how can we address those different areas of water use and what can we do to use water more efficiently in those different categories. So toilets, oh, actually, first, yep, go ahead. It's okay, Melissa. Um, one thing that's gonna help us kind of in general make conservation a little bit easier are some of these organizations that will look at water using appliances or water using fixtures and they'll kind of, um, 
put their stamp of approval on them. So most people, when you think of Energy Star, most people just kind of think of energy savings, but Energy Star rated appliances that use water also have a water saving component. Um, so there's, there's lists like the most efficient clothes washer list that Energy Star has and other lists and other products that are um, tagged with their logo that are gonna save water as well. And then you have the Consortium for Energy Efficiency. They have a fantastic kind of program for rating clothes washers and breaking down how much water is used um, to, for kind of cleaning each piece of laundry, those types of things. Um, so they also address energy usage in their ratings. And then the WaterSense program is an e EPA program that you can find their labels on all kinds of products, ranging from shower heads to toilets to irrigation controllers, um, all kinds of things. So that's a logo that you'll probably see fairly often once you start looking for it. And so if you see products with any of these logos on them, you'll know that there's some type of both likely an energy saving as well as a water saving component for them. So next slide. Now we can kind of dive in to a little bit. Folks were interested in how can we save water in each of these different areas. And so toilets took up about 25% roughly of indoor water usage. So that's kind of an area where we have a good opportunity to save water. So one of the things that we offer in the water and sewer division is we have a toilet rebate program. The program has been in existence for a number of years now, but it's still, there are still customers that are eligible for participating in the program. So kind of how the program works is if you have what we call a water hogging toilet, which is something that's probably before the early 90s, um, there are still a fairly older housing stock in Concord. So there's a number of um, places which would have these types of toilets. So if you upgrade one of those toilets that uses at least three and a half gallons per flush and you upgrade it to a water, um, water sense kind of labeled uh, toilet, it's gonna use about 1.28 gallons per flush. You're eligible for a $100 rebate. Um, and so each customer can be uh, eligible for up to two or a maximum of uh, two rebates per account. So you can find out more about the program itself and find the forms if you go to the conqueredma.gov slash h2o rebates uh, link and don't worry about remembering the links we'll kind of be able to share them at the end of the a program and you'll be able to take notes or we can kind of distribute them in an email follow-up and one thing that folks had complained about or had concerns about in the past was when people were, sw were switching from the older high volume water use toilets to the newer, more efficient toilets, they were having issues with um, kind of having to flush the toilet multiple times because they were having issues with um, kind of effectiveness of the flushing. And so this MAP testing program is an organization that's gonna test toilets for their efficiency and kind of make sure Nowadays, these new water saving models are kind of having better performance um, and, of course, more efficient performance than prior models. So some folks who had kind of tried to be early adopters for the water saving toilets had some had some challenges, but those things, the manufacturers have kind of worked out the kinks, but you can always check the, the performance of a toilet if you're concerned about that before making any type of purchases. But we do have that rebate program and we, ha we also have um, a kind of free giveaway device that we have in the water and sewer division, which is a fill cycle diverter. And so what that does is that's something that you can use to simply just retrofit your existing toilet. If you're not in the market for upgrading your toilet and you wanna be a little bit more efficient without too much kind of work or labor intensive um, investment, it's a simple little kind of plastic device that will divert more flow into filling the tank and less flow into the bowl of the toilet which doesn't impact the performance at all, but it will just kind of um, have less water going down the bowl. Um, and so that's a simple way that you can conserve water with your toilet as well. So next we'll take a look at showers and faucets. Those are the next kind of higher users inside the home. And so timing is everything. Um, shorter showers are gonna obviously save water, turning off the faucets when you're brushing your teeth or you know when you're um, doing a load of dishes, those types of things, timing is definitely important. So another free giveaway we have is a shower timer. So it looks kind of just like this little sand timer in the center of the screen here. And it has a nice um, suction cup where you can stick it onto your shower wall. And if you turn that um, so that the sand is all the way at the top when you first get in and you let turn kind of start it when you get into the shower and you let that pass through, it's about five minutes. 
So that's kind of the, the standard is a five minute shower is efficient and saves some, some water for you. And you can see, I have a nice little water sense logo on the shower head over there. That's a great device that had, that water sense has a number of different models that you can find at your local hardware store. Some of them are down to about 1.75 gallons per minute. Older models might have been three or four or even five gallons per minute. So you can save a significant amount of water by switching to a water sense labeled shower head. We also have those available for free giveaways in the office. Um, so we do have some water conserving shower heads that you can try if you're not sure. If you're not super picky about the way it looks, um, the ones we have are, are nice looking, but everyone's got different style, right? So those are something you can try out quickly and say, okay, I have multiple showers. I wanna try one and see how it works. And then you can kind of make the decision if that's gonna work for your family um, there. And so next slide. Now we're gonna make our way over to clothes washers. So we also have a rebate program for high efficiency clothes washers. So that Energy Star logo I mentioned earlier, the Energy Star program does have a most efficient list of the year, which they update regularly and they have one for clothes washers. So for the rebate program that we have for clothes washing machines, it, you can submit an application for a rebate of up to $150 credit on your water bill. And you, in order to qualify, the model that you purchase just needs to be on the Energy Star current most efficient list. So when I last checked the list this morning, there was about 35 or so different models on there. So there's well-known manufacturers. Um, there's a variety of different opportunities for choosing a model that's gonna work for your lifestyle. But that list kind of, what the Energy Star Most Efficient List aims to do is kind of try to pull out models that have superior efficiency, but also have some kind of innovative technology. So they're constantly updating that list and coming up with new and improved models that are gonna save both water and energy. Um, next slide. And then I think it was about 12% or so roughly that we saw on that pie chart of indoor water usage can be attributed to leaks. So the most common types of leaks that you're gonna find in your home are usually associated with the toilet. Um, so I also, I have fielded a number of calls from customers who have water bills that are a little bit higher than expected. And more often than not, we are able to kind of trace that unanticipated usage back to a leaky toilet flapper. And if you're somewhat handy and you feel comfortable tackling a, a small fix, it's usually a fix that you can do with, you know, a quick part from the hardware store for $5 or less and save some water in your house. Um, of course, dripping faucets and some leaky valves are gonna be other things that you might want some professional help to take a look at, but those are kind of the common sources for it leaks inside. And so something that we have at the water and sewer division is a toilet leak detection kit, which sounds kind of fancy, but it's pretty much just a couple of dye tablets that you can put into the tank of your toilet. And if you drop in one of these tablets into the tank and you don't use the toilet and you wait about 15 minutes or so, if you see any of that color dissipate into the bowl, then that's going to indicate that you have a leak somewhere in your toilet and you are gonna to wanna to get that prepared and you'll be able to save yourself some, some money there. If you don't have access to a, the special tablet, you can just use food filling. Um, and then another thing to kind of uh, be aware of is your water meter can be a helpful tool in helping you find household leaks. So if you get familiar with your water meter, some of the older style ones will have what we actually call a leak indicator. So it's a little triangle, it's usually red. And if that, dial is moving when you know that there's no water use going on in the home that can indicate a potential leak so something's using water that you're not anticipating um, and i like this graphic here on the right that epa's water sense program kind of pulled together and it just shows that leaks account for an estimated one trillion gallons of water throughout the, the united states so it's a it's a a big issue and you know just kind of getting like i said getting familiar with your your water meter and knowing um signs to spot and look for leaks um again those toilets are the most common culprit in, in older um, models and you can save up to 10 percent on your water bill if you're able to track down one of these small leaks um, so it's just a good thing to kind of be aware of next slide 
So that's a lot of information about indoor water use. And now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about outdoor water use. So we're gonna revisit this chart that we saw earlier, which shows average daily demand, winter, summer demand, and then the average peak day. And this kind of, when we're framing it in the, the lens of outdoor water use, um, it helps us realize that the main difference of what's going on for water use between winter months and summer months is really that outdoor water use. So if we consider winter demand to be essential water use, we can consider that difference between winter and summer to be non-essential water use. And so things that we have to consider are, you can see these additional kind of lines up here on the chart. So you can see that green dashed line that says summer pumping capacity. So in the water and sewer division, we kind of have to be aware of what supplies do we have that are operational? Are there any supplies that have maintenance needs? Um, and we try to do all those things in a way that we can avoid hiccups in the summer months, but sometimes that's not um, entirely feasible and mechanical issues can happen at any time. So that 3.1 million gallons per day is, if we were to lose one station, we can reliably provide about a little more than 3 million gallons per day. Well, we might run into trouble if we're in the summer months and we're, we're in the period of time where we're expecting average peak demand because we might not be able to pump that much. So next slide. That's where we come into water use restriction. So I'm hoping that you all have seen this seasonal water demand management plan before, but if not, I'm gonna give you a brief tour. This plan was updated most recently in the spring of 2017 in an effort to kind of make the plan a little bit more accessible and understandable. So when we revise the plan, we focus on lawn watering um, because that's really the biggest outdoor water user where we have the most trouble kind of keeping up with demands attributed to lawn watering. So you can see we have adopted the green, yellow, red stoplight kind of um, program here. So in green, we have the seasonal water conservation advisory, which we're, we want people to be mindful of their water use. So the recommended lawn watering is one day or one inch per week. Um, and then things like watering your, sh your shrubs or your flower, flower bed or garden or things, that's all fine. You can fill your swimming pool. We want you to be cognizant of your water use, but we're not in a position where we're super concerned about being able to reliably consistently provide water. Now, if that were not the case and we were, let's say it had been a period of time where there were um, extensive high temperatures, lack of rainfall, or if one of our supplies were to be in need of maintenance or to have a mechanical failure, we might bump up to that lawn watering restriction which is a mandatory restriction for one day per week of watering. Things like watering your, um, your vegetables is still okay, because um, that's something you're gonna be doing kind of hand watering. Uh, filling up your swimming pool, not the best timing, those types of things. Um, and then if we were really in trouble with being able to kind of meet demand, then we can be looking at a lawn watering ban. Um, so that would be a complete prohibition on lawn watering. Um, and so we'll go to the next slide and kind of see what are the triggers for changing the levels of the seasonal demand management plan. So one of the, the triggers is really the calendar. So the seasonal demand management plan goes into effect each calendar year on May 1st, and it goes through September 30th. So every year on May 1st, we're in that green um, conservation advisory. I shouldn't say every year, but we, we plan to start the year in, in the conservation advisory. So things that could trigger um, kind of bumping up that level of restriction to going into a lawn watering restriction or going into a lawn watering ban could be a number of different things, one of which could be last year, like we were in the drought. Um, so it could be kind of environmental triggers or regulatory triggers. So some folks have permits where the state says, okay, if, the, if there's a drought declared in your region, you have to restrict um, lawn watering to one day per week or to not at all. Um, we, last year, we went into a water use restriction. I think it was about two days before this, the, the significant drought was declared in the Northeast region. Um, so we were kind of in keeping with that environmental trigger. Um, other things that can trigger it are going to be maintenance. So 
simultaneously last year, one of our supplies did have a mechanical failure. So we were both in extensive dry periods and we had a supply that was unavailable for maintenance. So that kind of triggered us to go into the lawn watering restriction. And other things that can trigger that are really water quality. Um, so we will be embarking on PFAS sampling in uh, next week. And so that may drive restrictions based on kind of results from findings of those types of things. So it can be both environmental, mechanical, maintenance, calendar year, or even water quality. So there's a variety of different things that, that could trigger the level of restriction to change. Um, and we can talk a little bit about how you would know that that level of restriction has changed. Next slide. So if you have, if you're a customer with an irrigation system, um, we require that irrigation systems that are connected to the municipal water supply be registered with the department. And so that's really so that we know who are the customers that have systems and we can make sure that our system is protected with appropriate backflow prevention. And we also wanna know who are the customers that have the system so that if we do need help um, reducing water usage, we can provide some targeted outreach to those customers and remind them, okay, we're in a water use restriction or an outdoor watering ban. Um, so we can get the most bang for our buck with our outreach. Um, and so again, if you are an irrigation customer and we were to go into that one day per week lawn watering restriction, the day per week that you're allotted for watering is gonna align with your municipal trash pickup. So if your trash picked up on Tuesday, your watering day is Tuesday. If you are not a municipal um, trash collection customer, you can simply go to conqueredma.gov slash watering day and that will bring you to this nice map you have on the left side. And you can simply go to the interactive map, type in your address, and you'd be able to find out which day you are allotted for watering. Um, and so we provide outreach on any changes in the seasonal demand management plan in a variety of different avenues in an effort to make sure everyone is aware of these changes. So you have probably seen, we have nine different kind of street signs um, throughout town. So those always go up right around May 1st. And if the level of restriction would change. They would go from the green sign to the yellow sign or the red sign as needed. Um, we also leverage the town's news and notice system. So if you're signed up for that, you would get an email notification that the level of restriction had changed. We also use our website to make sure that we post the sign, um, the little sign graphic so that people can go take a quick look and just see what level we're in. Um, we also use the town's social media platforms and we'll even use code red, especially when we really wanna make sure that people get that message. Next slide. And so this is a, a nice chart that I like to share to kind of help people visualize messaging and kind of response. So there's definitely a lot going on here, but the, the blue line is water usage. Um, the green bars at the bottom are just demonstrating if there was any precipitation that occurred. And then the, um, the red dotted line really shows the temperature. And so you'll see at the top, we have some green stars and some yellow stars. And so the green stars indicate when we sent out messaging regarding the seasonal conservation advisory, just kind of reminding people that we should be using best management practices for outdoor watering, reminding people that that's recommended to be one day per week or one inch per week of water. Um, and then those yellow stars indicate when we did, uh, when we initiated the lawn watering restriction, and then when we sent out kind of a reminder notice. So one thing that you'll kind of see is that we had a steady in increase in water usage up until we sent out that initial lawn watering restriction notice. And you can see that water usage dropped off pretty significantly almost immediately when we sent out that message, which is fantastic because we know that the message is being received and people are being responsive which is exactly what we need. So you could see water usage was a little over three and a half million gallons per day. Then we sent out that message in a drop pretty substantially down to two million gallons per day. But then you can see that that usage starts to creep up as people start to kind of get a little bit more lax in their um, kind of watering practices. And then we sent out the additional reminder, hey, we really need your help. Um, you know, we're getting a little bit tight on water supplies reminder, it's one day per week. Um, and you can see, again, we get that immediate response from folks, but then 
the water usage kind of tended to jog up and down a little bit. So what we're hoping to do is kind of provide education and kind of reach those customers that do have irrigation systems because those are really the ones um, who are able to help us make that largest dent in water usage and kind of get consistent response as opposed to kind of just an immediate response and then relaxing of practices. So I feel like it's just a helpful graph to sort of have an idea of what does water usage really look like over the summer and, and how effective is our messaging in getting people to kind of um, get on board with what we're asking them to do. Next slide. So another topic that folks were interested in kind of learning a little bit more about was sustainable landscapes. So, um, well, I think it was two summers ago now, the Sustainable Concord Landscape Handbook was finalized. That's a fantastic resource if you're considering kind of moving away from traditional lawn landscapes to something a little bit more sustainable that's gonna require less um, watering, less maintenance, and kind of less maybe fertilizers or chemical treatments, those types of things. So that's a fantastic resource if you're in the market for kind of trading out some of your, your grass. And another great alternative is the demonstration gardens um, that were installed in conjunction with this project. And so we have three demonstration gardens throughout town. One's over at the main branch of the Concord Free Public Library, one's over at the Concord Carlisle High School, and one's over in Junction Park. And so in these different demonstration gardens, there's three different lawn alternative plantings. And so these are kind of just designed to say, these are things that replicate the lawn or the traditional grass lawn that people love, um, that use a little bit less water and require a lot less maintenance in most cases. So these were just a way for people to physically kind of be able to see what do these alternatives look like? What do they feel like? What do they, can I go over and look, um, you know, in May when we're first into the growing season or April when we're first in the growing season, what do they look like in July when it's really hot and what do they look like at the end of the season? So it's a great opportunity to just take a look and see and feel something a little bit different than the traditional kind of grass seed that most folks end up having in their, their landscapes. Next slide. And then another great alternative our rain gardens. So those are something that you can also find more resources about in that sustainable landscaping handbook. But rain gardens are great in a number of ways. Um, they can replace, again, that uh, water hungry lawn that you have and you can use native plantings that are going to attract local or uh, pollinators and that are going to help sort of slow the flow of water over your landscape and kind of help that water get back into the groundwater. Um, so you'll help with a little bit of groundwater recharge and slow any flow and that can also help if you're near to, let's say you're near to a local pond or stream, it'll help mitigate any of the impacts of kind of when we get those flashy big rainstorms with lots of runoff, it'll help kind of slow the amount of water that's going into those local water bodies and sometimes if there's no slow in the flow, the water is maybe either too warm or too cold for the organisms that are living in that water body and it can kind of shock them. So a rain garden is a nice way to kind of spruce up your, your landscape, make it a little, um, you know, beautify it a little bit and make it more friendly for local pollinators and just a little less water hungry. And so you can also use um, compost that you can actually get, Concord residents are able to get compost from the compost site over on Walden Street for free. So subject to availability, of course. <laughs> um, but that's a, something that you can use on your rain garden or in your um, kind of sustainable landscaping endeavor that will make it even more sustainable. Um, and then people wanted to know a little bit more about rain barrels. And so rain barrels are another great tool that can help in a lot of ways that are similar to the rain gardens I just mentioned, where they can help, even if you don't have a lot of need for the water, for watering your landscape, um, it again kind of just will help to slow the flow. So if there is flashy rains, you're gonna capture some of that rain on site and give it an opportunity if you do use it on your landscape um, to kind of stay local, infiltrate it back into the groundwater and give us a little bit of recharge as opposed to just kind of sheeting off and going down into, you know, storm drains or off your impervious pavements, those types of things. And so there are both the kind of plastic 
versions of rain barrels and then the um, wooden rain barrels that you can acquire as well. The plastic barrels, the one shown on the left here, um, that's I think the brand's Earth Minded. And so these are models that were are pretty popular um, in the sense that they're a little bit more attractive than the kind of big old blue barrels that people used to use for rain barrels, which still work perfectly fine and accomplish the same kind of goal. Um, but these barrels, you're actually able to kind of take that cover off and plant something in the top. So it can be kind of more um, of a way to also spruce up your lawn and make it a little more attractive um, as opposed to the models where it just was this big blue barrel. And then of course we have the whiskey barrels. So um, you can get the plastic barrels pretty much anywhere nowadays. They're available in a lot of locations online and you, sh you should be able to find them at a local hardware store. The, the wooden barrels are a little bit harder to find, um, but if you do a little bit of searching on Craigslist or, or, or something like that, you'll probably find a lot of these whiskey barrels up in Maine. And if you wanna take a ride and um, you might wanna roll down your windows, otherwise it will smell a little bit like whiskey. Um, they're a great attractive way to kind of, again, make your, your landscape a little bit prettier, capture water. Um, the easiest ways to use water from a rain barrel are, are really if you're gonna kind of, um, you know, fill up a bucket or something like that or a watering can and kind of do a little bit of hand watering. They may be usable if you're going to use a soaker hose kind of nearby, but they're not really going to be the most effective if you're looking to use kind of a handheld nozzle with a hose. Um, there's just not enough pressure in there, um, but they are a great resource for kind of conserving water and saving water and you can use it for watering your, um, your vegetables if you're looking at kind of the fruiting plants because you don't necessarily want everything that's coming off of your roof going onto, let's say, lettuce or something like that that you might be growing. But if you're growing something like peppers or strawberries or something that's fruiting, perfectly fine to kind of use rain barrel water. Um, or you can just use it for ornamental plantings or those types of things, or even something as simple as, okay, well, I'm gonna wash off my muddy boots before I go inside and I'm just gonna use this captured water in my rain barrel. Um, and next slide, perfect. So these are a list of kind of some helpful links that you may find some additional information. So the kind of conservation link is really just the landing page for all things water conservation. So it'll give you tips and tricks for indoor conservation, outdoor conservation. Um, it'll link you from there. You can kind of jump to a bunch of different programs. Uh, you'll be able to find out the status of the um, seasonal demand management plan, all those types of things. The H2O rebates is kind of the quick link to get to the applications and information for any water rebates that we have. The Greenscapes links is going to bring you to the section on sustainable landscaping. So be able, you'll be able to find the sustainable landscaping handbook there. You'll be able to find the garden blog from when we installed those demonstration gardens on there and some um, information on composting and, and a bunch of other topics there. If you use the sustainability link, that'll bring you to all things sustainability in town. So it'll include information on water conservation, of course, but other different programs in town. And so I think you may find um, the, I think it's our your sustainable home now kind of brochure where you can find more information about different programs in town to make your house more sustainable, those types of things. And then the irrigation link is going to bring you to all things that you never knew you needed or wanted to know about irrigation in Concord. So registration information, if you're considering a new system, things to be aware of, um, you know, the connection fees, all those types of things. And again, it will have links to what the current status of if there are any water use restrictions or anything like that. Um, so with that, I think that's all the kind of information I had prepared in response to the um, kind of poll that we received and feedback we received from folks on the Facebook page. So I'm happy to entertain any other questions that folks had that came up during the presentation or um, that I didn't address when I was already preparing that presentation. You had a couple of questions in the chat. 
Would you like me to read them to you? That would be great. Okay, the first one is, how do you manage whether people are following the rules for watering and what is the penalty if they are not? So this is a great question um, because enforcement uh, and monitoring for um, water use restrictions is definitely a full-time job. <laughs> so we have the list of, it's at last count, it's somewhere around 900 or so registered irrigation users. So we kind of have a list of folks um, who we know have systems. And then what we do when we're in a water use restriction is we have members of the crew who will kind of ride through dif the different zones of town and um, kind of log any activity that's going on outside of someone's designated watering day. And then what we try to do is kind of provide some educational outreach to those folks and say, okay, you're watering outside your watering day. Maybe you didn't know we were in a water use restriction. Um, you know, this is your watering day. Here's where you can find more information, those types of things. And then we do, if we were to ever get to the point of kind of real enforcement, there is a fine associated um, with watering outside of your designated day. Um, but we really try to keep the campaign as much as an educational opportunity because it's typically that people just either aren't aware or weren't able to change their controller or something like that, um, as opposed to kind of more intentional <laughs> um, watering outside of their day and just making people aware of why we have a water use restriction. We really wanna make sure we have the water available for essential uses. So we wanna make sure we have enough water for you to um, prepare food, bathe, um, all those types of things. We wanna make sure we have water for agricultural purposes and we wanna make sure we have water available for fire protection. So particularly when it's the dry season, um, we wanna make sure that we have that available. So balancing people's desire to have an attractive landscape with the real um, kind of drivers for water use. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is, which is better for water conservation when it comes to vegetable gardens? Hand watering or I think it's going to be drip irrigation, I think I recall. Yeah, drip irrigation. Okay, I might lean on Melissa for a little <laughs> bit of feedback for this since she's more expert at this than I. Sure, happy to help, Alex. Um, it... The question, it's a very good question. It's kind of a catch 22 almost. So drip irrigation is fantastic because it gets the water to the roots where the plant really needs the water. But often drip irrigation is hooked up to a timer and is often a pressurized system and is always pressurized. So it's very prone to having leaks. You know, it's all made up of plastic parts. Those plastic parts um, fail pretty easily, especially when there's big temperature changes and they're outside. Um, and then it's often a set it and forget it and doesn't come with a rain sensor. So, you know, it could be going off every day when you don't need it. Um, on the other hand, when you are hand watering, it might not necessarily be getting the water to the exact area that it needs to, but because you're sitting there physically holding a trigger, you're probably not gonna use as much water as you would if you just were on the set it and forget it mode. So catch 22, um, it's really um, how you think you can best manage and monitor your own system. Yeah, that makes sense too. Um, the next question here in the chat is, do households with irrigation systems on average use less or more water than other households with similar acreage? That's a good question. So, um, you know, when we compare a home with irrigation to one without irrigation that is the same size lot, you can see anything from two to five times more water usage by a customer who has irrigation as opposed to one without. Um, kind of comparing those with irrigation with the same sized landscape, I don't think we've done kind of as much analysis in that realm, which could be an interesting sort of avenue for 
future exploration, but there is definitely a marked difference between those with irrigation and those without, even though they have the same sized landscape. Okay. Um, this next one, it says, I live in a condominium that draws its irrigation water from our own well. How do we convince residents that our landscaping still needs to conserve water on climate driven restriction days? So that's a great question and kind of brings up a, a good point that I didn't mention, which is that kind of the water use restrictions apply currently to those who are connected to the municipal water system. And so I think something to kind of keep in mind is that we are all interconnected as far as our local watershed. So even though you may, be have, you may have your own private well for supplying irrigation water, that's still gonna have an impact on the local water resources. Um, so if our, if our region is in a drought, it's not specific to the areas around our water supplies, it's really specific to the region. And so we in Concord, we are part of the, the Concord River watershed um basin <laughs> and that's considered kind of a groundwater stressed basin so what we do in concord kind of affects other communities in the region so anything that we can do to conserve whether it's kind of for um benefit or addressing municipal water supply concerns or private water supply concerns is really going to help the local region and not just specific to concord so it's really um, going to have an impact wider than just our own doorstep type of thing. The next question seems oh. related. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Renny. I just wanted to add kind of something that a lot of people don't think about when they have their own private wells is that often on the days that you need the most water is when it's warmest out. And when it's warmest out, most people are also cranking their AC. So most of those days are also peak energy use days. So when you're conserving water and you have a well, or even when you don't have a well for that matter, because it takes us water uh, energy to pump, but um, you're also conserving energy because producing that water and bringing it to your home takes a lot of energy where probably what I think the, one of the top 10 energy users in the community so by reducing the amount of water that you either use from the municipal slide, municipal supplies or your own private wells can really help the town achieve their peak shaving goals. That makes sense. I wouldn't have thought of that. Um, here, this question adds, some Massachusetts towns have bylaws that restrict households with private wells to the same non-essential outdoor water use as the households on the public water supply. Does Concord have such a bylaw or might it be under consideration? We don't presently have such a bylaw. There is kind of interest throughout the Commonwealth in kind of trying to align restrictions um, that apply to municipal customers as well as private customers, um, but that's not something that currently exists in Concord. All right, looks like a couple more questions are coming in the chat here. Um, this one is, you mentioned you will begin PFAS sampling next week. Will that date be made public? And if so, how? Um, the data of sampling is really kind of um, an internal uh, deadline that we set. We have to sample in the month of April. Um, we're just kind of trying to get the sampling completed um, as part in conjunction with MassDEP's sampling program. And the results of the sampling program will most certainly be made public once they have been kind of received and quality control information has been vetted and all that type of stuff, we will most certainly make that information available to our customers. Yep. Okay. Um, do you think everyone knows what PFAS sampling is? Um, so PFAS <laughs> is the acronym for polyfluoral alcohol <laughs> substances or per and polyfluoral alcohol substances. 
And so uh, <laughs> definitely a mouthful, definitely easier to say PFAS, but it's um, kind of a hot topic that has received lots of news coverage. And there was a regulation that was recently kind of promulgated or put into effect in Massachusetts, regulating those late in the fall of last year, which kind of um, the regulation also included requirements for sampling for public water systems. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question here. Are you discouraging new irrigation systems since they use two to five times more water than similar size lots? <laughs> Melissa's waving her hand. I think she wants to. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a tough question and Kim, I absolutely agree. I, I wish I could tell everybody, no, please don't. And I wish there was a regulation, but unfortunately it's not that easy. So what we do have is that any new home um, that uses 30 gallons um, per minute or more, which is any home with an irrigation system, um, we have them do what's called a water use impact report. And that details everything possibly that they can do to save water. And we encourage them not to install an irrigation system and to build the most sustainable um, building that they can be. Because we know that um, the ability to use irrigation systems in the future is just going to decrease and decrease. And we want our residents to um, start off on the right foot and really um, have landscaping, make the investment to have landscaping that's going to last, not make the investment to have landscaping that's going to last, you know, five years until you can't water it anymore and then you're going to have to design a whole new landscape. Uh, so we really work with anybody who meets those requirements, including, you know, the multi-unit developments and PRDs that are going in. So it's on our radar. Wish we could do more at this point. Uh, we're, we're getting there and we're getting better. <laughs> well, we're almost out of time and there are a couple more questions. And I think if there are more than we can answer now, can we follow up with an email so that everyone gets their questions answered? All right, well, yep. then I'll just, I'll keep reading here. Um, well, here, I agree with this one. Alexandra, what a fine, clear presentation tonight. I would definitely second that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, the next one is the press release from your department last week mentioned that Nagog Pond Water may benefit potential future users from Littleton and Acton. How are you envisioning that this might work? Um, it's, you know, Alex, both Alex and myself haven't been really involved in a lot of the, um, water rights litigation that has been going on, um, over the last five years between, with Concord, Acton, and Littleton. Um, Kim, we'd, Kim, we'd be happy to chat offline with the water sewer superintendent, John Rogers and Alan Cathcart. Um, I just don't want to provide you with any misinformation at this point, but um, happy to assist and help make the connection. Well, here's another one that says, Melissa too, thanks, such important information. <laughs> so, thank thanks, you. Judy. <laughs> <laughs> And let's see, here's, there's, oh, there, there are quite a few more here. Maybe, do you want, it's two minutes to eight. Um, how do you think we should grow? Just answer the rest by email, I think. Let's um, see. Let's, can you see them now or? I mean, yeah, and I think the one that um, a couple people were kind of uh, questioning is, will, be, we, will we be in drought this summer? And chances are, yes, currently we are not, I don't believe, but I believe there is a drought management task force meeting within the next week to evaluate our current situation. Um, I, my best guess, if I'm reading the crystal ball, is that 
most likely this year we'll probably start off in the yellow with lawn watering restrictions um, because we are working with a lot of maintenance um, issues right now that we're trying to address. We are venturing into the PFAS or emerging contaminant sampling um, in the next month. And so I wish I had a crystal ball to say that no, everything will be good and we'll have plenty of rain to sustain our landscapes. But at this point in time, I would plan on most likely starting off the year in yellow. So well, I want to thank you both very much. I learned so much and I think you did a great job and I really appreciate it and the library appreciates it too. So thank you. It was great. Great work. And we thank can you. follow up with an email to everyone with the links included and um, I think Barbara we were going to capture the rest of the chat. So yes, yes, I have it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I, I think that's it. It's eight o'clock now. And I thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And we do have the Your Sustainable Home Now brochures out front at the library. Kate gave us some there. So you can swing by and grab one when you're getting your curbside pickups. Wonderful. Thank, thank you, you so all. Much. And thank you to Renny and Barbara for the opportunity and Kate for all your continued support with all this fun stuff. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.